Well, hello. This is part two of your role as the facilitator during STEM challenges. I did part one last week and I will either link that here somewhere or in the description below. So if you haven't watched that, stop this, go back and watch that first. So today we're going to talk about what happens once you call time and the students are done building their first iteration. There are a couple of different options here. The first one I like to do whenever there is time is a gallery walk. So I will have the students all come get in a line and no matter how old they are, no matter what age, I always have them put their arms behind their back and hold their elbows so they don't reach out and touch somebody's design. It's, uh, it's definitely saved a lot of towers and I highly recommend it. So after the gallery walk, what I like to do is have a Q&A session. For the first several STEM challenges that you have, you're going to want to do this whole class so that students get the modeling and understand how the, what types of questions they should be asking each other. If the designs are portable, then you can have the groups bring up their design to the front of the class while the others are sitting. More frequently, they're not really very portable unless you actually put that into your criteria and constraints list. So we usually actually will just walk around to each station, to each group. I usually give a group about 30 seconds to just talk about their designs. And then after that, we start the Q&A. If it's your very first challenge or one of the very first challenges, you'll probably do most of the initial asking and then eventually you'll start to pull back and you'll let the other students ask the questions instead of you. You'll ask fewer and fewer as time goes by. like to do to make sure that every student gets practice with their oral communication standards is to allow each student in a group that is presenting to call on a student in the class to ask a question and answer that question. So what are some good questions to ask? Well, let's take a look at a few examples that are pretty universal across STEM challenges. These are from a Thanksgiving challenge, so that's why you see the clip art that you do. The first seven of these are my standard questions, and the eighth is always a new quote that I've selected in themes of hard work, perseverance, failure, luck, etc. The question that says, what do you think is the purpose of doing the STEM challenge actually came from my friend, Mr. Reagan, and I love it, so I use it now all the time. It's really fascinating to hear what they come up with. There are lots of ways to hold discussions. My favorite, though, is to give groups five to ten minutes to discuss these questions within their group, and then I like to call on volunteers or do the thing where you pull out sticks with names on it um, for people to share out a couple of their answers, whole class. So once you've held the class discussion, the groups will record and reflect upon their first iteration of the design. Let's go to an example of what I would use in my class. Even when students work in teams, I require each student to fill out these forms. You can send them home as homework if you like, but I usually have them do this in class. Make sure you don't use this as a replacement for a second iteration. This reflection should serve as the foundation, not a substitution for modifying designs. So at that point, you're probably going to call it a day. They've already accomplished quite a bit. The following days, you might want to add some extension activities. And I've got a few examples of some things you can do for those. Let's take a look. Extensions will vary, of course, based on the specific challenge, but there are a few things that work with most challenges. The first is math questions or task cards. Have students create math questions that can be answered by their design data. The example shown is from one of my challenges called Pick and Pack, in which students pack a trunk with items of different point values. You can create task cards with your own questions or give the students task card templates to create their own, which is my preference. Then you can use those to play a game of Scoot, or you can save and store copies of their questions and data from math centers, early finishers, sub days, etc. Another idea is, is for students to create process flows for the building their designs. They can turn these into paragraphs or even exchange with other teams to try and build each other's designs based on the process flow. This is kind of like that activity where you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich based on the directions you're given. And that can be really fun and also a great way to work on precise writing. You can also use designs to inspire students to research related topics or conduct scientific inquiries or experiments. And there are usually more opportunities for writing if you look. 
Basically, look for all your cross-curricular connections for both new and review concepts, then whittle it down to the time you have available. With extension activities, the possibilities are almost endless. You just want to take a look at what you can use to review, to research, to introduce new concepts across all your subject areas, and it can turn into quite a little rabbit hole. You don't have to do extensions with every single STEM challenge, but when you can, it's, it's a nice jumping off point because you know the students already have prior knowledge. If you feel like you don't have time to really sit back and examine what you could do for extension activities, you might want to take a look at what's already out there. So take a look at Odyssey of the Mind. They have some great STEM challenges. Take a look at Teachers Pay Teachers. Shameless plug, I do have freebies. And finally, whether you do extension activities or not, you do always want to do the second iteration if you can, whenever possible. So one of the things that I would recommend is before doing the second iteration, read whatever reflections the students had on their first iteration. If you ask the same kinds of questions that I do, some of the things that I really like to look at are what materials did they say they'd really like to have if, if they were going to build again. And sometimes I actually throw some of those materials in there because a lot of times they're a good idea. Um, and then another thing that I like to do as well is uh, I'll tweak sometimes the criterion constraints. If maybe I made the challenge a little too easy the first time, I might make it a little bit more difficult the next by adding a new constraint or new criterion. All right, so that's a wrap on your role as the facilitator. Make sure you tune in next week. I'm going to be covering all things materials, how to get them, what to use, a little bit of cost comparison, and maybe a few other things. See you next week. Please subscribe.